Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. On behalf of the Canadian International Council of Montreal, I welcome you to this important discussion. Um, I am the former president of the CIC Montreal, now a current board member, and also the executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Rights Studies. I think it's very, very fascinating today that we all gather here for this event in which we talk about um, all roads lead to Pakistan, uh, the role of Pakistan in supporting the Taliban in the takeover of Afghanistan. We've seen horrible pictures emerge of women being kicked out of educational opportunities, not being allowed to work. We've seen people being hung from buildings. Really, we're seeing Afghanistan return to the dark ages. Um, and it's, it's a very um, difficult situation to watch from a human rights perspective, but also has wide, far-reaching security implications for not just Afghanis, for Afghans, but also the wider international community because of the possibility of, the, of terrorism. But, but I think this is a discussion that needs to be had, and we're very fortunate to, today to have with us Chris Alexander. Um, Chris, welcome. Um, Chris, Thanks, is, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Chris is the former Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan. Um, he was then after that was um, the deputy special representative of Secretary General to Afghanistan and then became, after leaving Afghanistan, served as a minister in the Canadian government. Um, so Chris uh, is one of uh, Canada's top experts in Afghanistan, if not the world. So we're really pleased to have you uh, with us today, Chris. We've been following you on Twitter, um, seeing how the Pakistani uh, Consul General to Toronto has put pressure on the Conservative Party to try to get you to stop talking about um, sanctioning Pakistan. And we've also saw that um, just, uh, probably about six weeks ago, that the Pakistani foreign ministry put out a tweet kind of condemning you for, for voicing um, your thoughts about what's happened in the past um, couple of weeks, if not months. So with that, Chris, I'd like to maybe invite you uh, to make opening remarks, but I'll tell everyone in the audience, uh, Chris is going to give his opening remarks. I'll have a few questions for him, but for those that are following this on YouTube or on Twitter or on Facebook, you can pose questions directly to Chris and I will read those to him. So please, if you have questions, uh, start thinking about them. Don't be afraid, don't be shy, send them in through the messenger channel. But Chris, um, let's give you the floor and tell us what, why do all roads lead to Pakistan? <laughs> well, thanks Kyle, thanks for having me. Uh, and it, it truly is um, gratifying, uplifting uh, to see so many people uh, interested in this issue uh, as well as all the other issues that CIC and um, and your organization, Kyle Miggs, um, provide a platform to discuss. Uh, I think we're at a time when international issues are uh, coming back into focus after many years of uh, of of lack of focus and and drift um, and and some real backsliding on issues that Canadians care about. Uh, it's time that we that we come to grips uh, with with uh, with what's been happening out there beyond our borders because it really does affect us here at home. And uh, I'm going to uh, cover some of the main uh, issues related to this issue, Pakistan's role in Afghanistan. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the questions, most of all. And you know, why is this discussion important uh, for Canadians, and why are so many Canadians? really leading the discussion of uh, how to engage with the region uh, after the Pakistan takeover, the um, <laughs> Iranian slip, the Taliban takeover in, in uh, the middle of August, just over a month ago. Uh, it's partly because of Canada's special legacy in Afghanistan over 20 years. We are really the only country that um, stood by this UN mandated mission with assistance on a large scale from beginning to end with boots on the ground, a, mil a significant military contribution for most of that time, for uh, a dozen plus years of that time, uh, and did so while not making the mistake that many of our allies made starting with the United States of being distracted uh, by the so-called war on terror and especially the uh, ill-fated, disastrous uh, invasion of Iraq, which has done so much to confuse uh, debate about Afghanistan and in the United States and elsewhere, and perhaps we can come back to that issue. So Canada has a clarity, uh, a potential for clarity on these issues uh, that perhaps others do not yet have, uh, and we shouldn't underestimate our, 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 our role as a potential 
catalyst for the right strategy uh, as we start to move forward into this new Taliban era. Why do all roads lead to Pakistan? Well, let's be honest, Kyle. The, the issue, the elephant in the room that uh, hasn't received enough discussion anywhere, even in the region uh, where these events unfolded, is that Pakistan has been fighting a war covertly and increasingly overtly in Afghanistan for the better part of 50 years. And here the story goes back to 1971, uh, the election uh, for to the parliament of what was then a much larger Pakistan, where the results um, were, were unpalatable to Pakistan's military leadership, particularly in East Pakistan, uh, leading to uh, a mili military repression of a nationalist uprising, leading to a conflict in which, into which India uh, became uh, centrally involved and resulting in a defeat of Pakistan's forces, probably uh, the, the most severe defeat they have, uh, they have uh, undergone in their history, uh, and, and the independence of what became Bangladesh. Now, that was an incredibly traumatic moment for Pakistan's generals, their military leaders. Uh, there's a photograph of uh, the then um, commanding general responsible for operations in East Pakistan, uh, General Niazi, signing uh, the surrender agreement in 1971 with his Indian counterparts crowded all around him. Uh, and this is seen as a symbol in Pakistan today of humiliation uh, and in India, of uh, you know a, a country that was engaged in violent repressions on a large scale at that time, receiving its just desserts. So it's really a, a nationalist touchstone. And for the purposes of Afghanistan, let's make a very long story short by saying that from that time forward, that crushing, the moment of that crushing defeat forward, Pakistan's military brain trust has really discarded the idea of ever succeeding in conventional warfare uh, against India and has put its eggs into two baskets. One, the drive to have nuclear weapons, uh, which of course succeeded uh, and the story of which uh, the, the really um, tawdry and, and, and disturbing story of which has been well-documented elsewhere. And secondly, they put their eggs into the basket of irregular warfare. Uh, it was in the early 1970s, right after uh, this defeat, that some of the first uh, Islamist leaders from Afghanistan were welcomed to Pakistan, where they started to receive military training. Uh, and later they became some of the most prominent names in the jihad of the 1980s. Uh, and many of them carried on in uh, with central roles in Afghanistan in the 90s and even into the century. So. Pakistan has been fighting a proxy war, an irregular war, an unconventional war in Afghanistan for 50 years. For 10 of those years, they had the U.S. as an ally because the Soviet Union was Af occupying Afghanistan. And for 20 of those years, from 9-11 onwards, the U.S., Canada, and other allies were in Afghanistan. Uh, but Pakistan kept up this campaign and was never persuaded to drop this campaign, basically because A, they denied it, B, the US didn't have the full picture, C, allies, particularly the UK, dissented when there was a push to be tough on Pakistan, and D, lines of communication for supplying the US-led mission ran through Pakistan, uh, and Pakistan was only too willing to threatened to cut off those lines of supply if they were forced uh, to do things, to make changes to their policy that they didn't want. So in effect, uh, Pakistan was the sponsor backing all the groups that were fighting us for 20 years. And why haven't we heard this story either now or earlier in all of its uh, unfortunate, ugly splendor? 
Uh, partly because many of the journalists covering Afghanistan today and throughout uh, the last 20 years continue to be based in Pakistan. There is an incredibly sophisticated um, discipline imposed on Pakistani journalists and international journalists when it comes to reporting on Afghanistan. And those that start to um, tease out uh, and, and report on uh, the reality of Pakistan's support for the Taliban and the Haqqanis and other groups are warned, intimidated, and pushed aside. Uh, i give you the example of my friend Carlotta Gall, who was the New York Times bureau chief in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, who's written impo an important book on the subject called The Wrong Enemy, but who was literally beaten up in her hotel room in Quetta, Baluchistan, uh, because she was in the eyes of her Pakistani host going too far. So the war has not yet been explained to the public uh, in any country fully, the war that Pakistan has really been fighting, the, the real forever war that continues to this day. Secondly, uh, reporting has been incomplete on these subjects. Uh, and I would say that Pakistan's military, through its um, directorate general responsible for public relations, uh, plays a very aggressive role around the world, including on social media. In, in trying to drown out any discussion of what is really going on. Uh, and thirdly, we're just starting to have uh, a discussion about why the strategy of the last 20 years failed. Uh, NATO defeated the Taliban in the field every time, um, and Afghan forces almost every time uh, there was a clash anywhere across uh, Afghanistan over 20 years, up until this spring and summer. But there was no way that this military campaign to um, oppose violent takeover by the Taliban was going to succeed in the long run, so long as it was being supported by the sixth largest military on the planet, namely Pakistan's army, on the scale that they have been doing. And so only now, you mentioned it earlier, Kyle, has there been a sustained campaign to draw attention to the need to sanction those in Pakistan supporting the Taliban and other groups. Uh, these are listed terrorist groups. These are groups that are taking Afghanistan literally backwards. Uh, it's astonishing and deeply, deeply disturbing to see every day. Uh, we're now into the second week uh, of a Taliban regime in Kabul that is the only authority on the planet banning education for girls. Uh, there are violent reprisals, summary executions, and war crimes being reported almost every day. Uh, and so there is an appreciation among Afghans, those who have the freedom to speak freely on these issues inside the country, uh, carefully on social media or outside of the country, as many now are, uh, about the next step, about the right strategy for bringing stability and eventually peace to Afghanistan, which has to involve ending this long war Pakistan has been fighting. It has to involve penalties for those who've been supporting this war. Uh, and finally, there is discussion, uh, nascent discussion, but serious discussion already in the US Senate, uh, in the US House of Representatives and in other parliaments about uh, how central it a failure it was in our NATO strategy not to address Pakistan's role from the very beginning. Uh, it's never too late to do the right thing. And if we're going to have leverage over any of the challenges and indeed the catastrophes that Afghans are not now facing from humanitarian to security to health, education, uh, repression of minorities, uh, women's rights, etc. We have to start ending the impunity of those who have been feeding, fueling, and driving this war from the very beginning. Uh, and those figures are primarily in General Headquarters, Raul uh, also in the Inter-Services Intelligence, uh, Pakistan's highly secretive uh, but highly influential premier intelligence organization, uh, as well as their civilian partners, uh, partners in bi business, partners uh, among uh, Pakistan's retired officer class, 
their role is the one that needs to come into focus if we are to uh, take Afghanistan finally out of this cycle of violence it's been in for five decades. And that's why all roads lead to Pakistan. All discussion, serious discussion of Afghanistan's face has to really start with this issue. Uh, and I would simply remind all of you that when you see a report in the New York Times or from Associated Press, as I did today, or other agencies that talks about failures and challenges and problems in Afghanistan and fails to mention Pakistan's role, you can be sure that this is someone who is uh, either deliberately ignoring the elephant in the room uh, or who's under the discipline uh, of, uh, of, of a very aggressive state that doesn't want this story to be known, hence the importance of discussions like today. Thanks, Kyle, and I'm open to everyone's questions. Sorry, I muted myself. That happens twice a day at least. Chris, thank you for, for that overview. Uh, just to, to maybe start up, you, so you're active in saying that we have to impose sanctions. And, and just to clarify, are you talking about sanctions uh, across against the entire country or more targeted sanctions against individuals like the Magnitsky style sanctions. Could you, could you expand on that? Definitely Magnitsky style sanctions are the ones that, um, that, that I'm advocating and that deserve serious consideration. No one wants uh, Pakistan as a whole, um, a country that has, that has uh, experienced too much conflict itself. Uh, to suffer from the measures that we now know uh, need to be contemplated and, and implemented to start to end the conflict in Afghanistan. Um, look at what the major democracies on the planet did in the wake of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. It took time, but in a matter of weeks uh, and then months in 2014, there was the beginning of a sanctions regime with Canada playing a, a central role against those in his Kremlin and in his power ministries, as they call them in Russia, uh, the, the security apparatus, Ministry of Defense, KGB, you know, today's KGB known as the FSB, uh, and other organizations who were responsible for the invasion and occupation of Donbass, as well as the invasion and occupation of Crimea, um, which continue to this day. This is exactly the kind of approach we should be taking with Pakistan. Uh, the Taliban gets its support very clearly from the military uh, and from a branch of the military known as the ISI that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they're very clear. It's very clear who the leaders are and who their civilian uh, uh partners are in uh, covering up this attempting to cover up this um this this invasion uh and in trying to sell it to the world as imran khan was doing at the united nations this past week uh so yes there should be targeted sanctions we should also be um vocal i think in insisting that existing sanctions be implemented um the half of the Taliban leadership group in Kabul uh, remains on the consolidated UN list of Taliban and Al-Qaeda figures who are already subject to sanctions. And Pakistan has violated those sanctions for upwards of 20 years in some cases, because there's supposed to be an arms embargo, uh, a travel ban, and uh, an asset freeze for all of these people. They have been living uh, in Pakistan throughout this time. None of those uh, sanctions has been implemented. Pakistan should be held to account for failing to implement a long-standing set of UN sanctions as well. Thanks, uh, Chris, for that uh, detail. This is very fascinating. Um, and I, I think you know, governments around the world and, and civil society groups need to really think about what you're saying and, 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 and push the sanctions agenda. I'm wondering. Uh, I'm wondering if you could explain about some of the groups are in danger. We, we we know the case of women. We've seen that women are allowed to go to work. That's going to see a bigger collapse of the economy. We see women are being kicked out of education. But there are also uh, ethnic and religious minorities that are under under danger. And I just want to mention the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington put out a statement 
uh, stating that the um, Hazara, the, the Shia Muslim minority community, is in real danger. Could you talk about some of the groups? Um, Afghanistan is not a homogenous society. There are many, many different groups. Tell us about who's in danger and, 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 and Taliban's past, who they might target. Sure. Well, I think we have to preface that discussion by saying that all Afghans still in the country are experiencing great hardship. Uh, and the you know, look at recent reports from the UN agencies, the level of hunger across the country as Afghanistan approaches what is traditionally a hungry season, late fall, winter, and early spring, uh, is literally skyrocketing. Uh, the numbers of people who do not know where the next meal is coming from <clears throat> has probably doubled since the Taliban uh, came into power. It was already very high. Uh, there are pictures coming out of people in Kabul, in cities, uh, crowded around bread shops, uh, hoping that someone will give them a handout because they do not have anything else to eat. So that priority, that large humanitarian, acute humanitarian crisis um, needs to be at the forefront of everyone's minds. But beyond that general picture, you're absolutely right. There are groups that are being targeted and the Hazaras are historically uh, on the receiving end of repression, nationalist sentiment by Kuchis who are nomads uh, from, connected to the main uh, Pashtun tribes and other Pashtun groups who have over centuries encroached on their land, which tend to be in the center of the country around the Hindu Kush. Uh, and there are, unfortunately, deep um, legacies of injustice for the Hazaras that go back centuries, but which are most remembered from the period of Abdul Rahman Khan, who was the emir during the time of British protectorate before 1919, and who launched several jihads against what he called jihads against the Hazaras, uh, displaced many of them, enslaved many of them, and that is still remembered to this day. Some among the Taliban, because they have this brutal, um, primitive, violent, uh, nationalist, uh, you know, really irreligious, but uh, pursued in the name of some um, Un, unrepresentative form of Islam uh, agenda, they are renewing this uh, campaign against the Hazaras. A and we saw other Pakistani proxies um, launching incredibly brutal attacks on Hazara civilians in the years leading up to this invasion of this summer. In May of this year, there was a serious, uh, sophisticated two bomb attack remotely detonated on schoolgirls in the uh, west of Kabul, in Dashti Barchi neighborhood, which is dominated by Hazaras, which led to the death of over 100 Afghans, uh, most of them Hazara children. Uh, so this deserves attention, this deserves uh, scrutiny, this deserves advocacy. Uh, and one of the areas where Canada should be um, taking action, as far as I'm concerned, is in championing the idea of the International Criminal Court, whose prosecutor has recently said he will be looking at war crimes committed by the Taliban, uh, the Islamic State and Khorasan and other groups, all of whom have links back to Pakistan's ISI. That should be a welcome uh, development because Afghanistan, through all these decades of, of, of um, conflict, has never had sustained accountability from its own institutions or from those supported uh, or, or from international institutions. Uh, and ending conflict, as we know from uh, around the world, has to involve ending impunity and starting truth telling and accountability. Uh, Afghanistan, unfortunately, is, is into another dark chapter, but our efforts to chronicle the crimes that are happening, to speak about them, uh, and to hold the perpetrators to account have to increase at this time, not uh, not 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 decrease in any way. Chris, thank you for bringing up the issue of justice and mentioning just yesterday that the new chief prosecutor of the ICC um, is is trying to get an investigation. I, I think I agree with you. The recent attack against schools, but if you look at the Taliban I mean, across 
last two decades, like numerous attacks on schools, numerous attacks against civilians, all considered crimes under the Rome Statute of the ICC. So, so um, that's, I think, an important um, thing that Canada and other countries uh, should pursue. Um, I, I'm wondering, Chris, if you could talk a bit about what's happening now between um, uh, between um, regional countries around Afghanistan. Uh, we know that you know the the Taliban have said that they were going to be inclusive, but there's no other ethnic minorities or women within the representation. There's also a link here with Tajikistan um, that perhaps you could explain to our audience uh, what the connections are and and what are the developments with uh, with Afga Afghanistan's northern neighbors. Yeah, thanks. Um, interesting question. I mean, first, uh, the neighbors have had always had uh, a central role in Afghan affairs. Uh, the country, in its current borders, was considered at least by the British uh, Raj authorities of the 19th century and Russian Tsarist authorities, whose whose borders started to run up against Afghanistan in the second half of the 19th century as a buffer state. Uh, and that meant that they considered themselves to have the right to interfere in Afghanistan. That remains the challenge today, that this uh, presumption that interfering in Afghanistan is acceptable uh, continues to this day, certainly in the case of Pakistan, but also in the case of some of the other neighbors. Uh, it's, it's not a presumption that uh, really any other country in the world today would would accept. Uh, and I think it needs to be challenged. But let's look at uh, the role of the neighbors. As the U.S. under Trump uh, decided that it really was going to withdraw um, and took this uh, long-standing negotiation with the Taliban in um, in a in a in a fateful direction at the beginning of 2020 by signing an agreement uh, the United States with the Taliban that excluded the Afghan government. Uh, the United States really uh, stopped caring about the fate of Afghanistan and became completely focused, as it remains today, on the well-being of its troops, uh, bringing its troops home, not um, incurring any more ca casualties uh, at all costs. And it was partly that decision to do a deal with the enemy and exclude the Afghan government that broke the morale of Afghan forces and of the Afghan people leading to the result today. But it also uh, brought in a role uh, through the Doha uh, process, a more prominent role for the neighboring states who came to be known as something called the expanded Troika in support of the United States in its discussions with the Taliban, which came to include the Afghan government uh, at a later stage. And the expanded Troika included Russia, um, Pakistan, Iran, and China. Uh, so not three countries, but four countries, uh, which made it uh, not a Troika, but a Troika plus. Uh, the expanded Troika made numerous vocal statements at meetings in Moscow, in Doha, and elsewhere that uh, the imposition of a new regime, a new reality by force in Kabul was unacceptable. No one would allow that. Obviously, Pakistan um, was was double dealing in saying that, as they have so often on issues related to Afghanistan. But I think all the other countries were, to one extent or another, surprised by the speed and finality of the Taliban takeover in mid-August. Uh, so where does China stand? Well. They consider Pakistan their main uh, ally anywhere in the world. They are delighted that the United States are gone. They're delighted that Pakistan has influence. Uh, Pakistan and not India now has uh, a larger share of the influence in Afghanistan. But they're uncomfortable with some of the terrorist groups that Pakistan continues to champion, including the East Turkestan Islamic movement, uh, which has been one of the main reasons why China is pursuing genocide in Xinjiang today. So there's um, an openness to the Taliban, but also 
ambivalence from China. Uh, Iran is uh, also pleased to see the United States gone, but unhappy that a Sunni extremist group, which was very hostile to Iran the last time they were in power, is there. Uh, very concerned about the possibility of refugee flows coming on a large scale. Uh, very concerned about the loss of influence for their clients, who include the Shia Hazaras. Uh, so even more ambivalence on the part of Iran. Uh, Uzbekistan seems to just want to do business uh, and uh, doesn't know whether that will be possible, uh, but hasn't taken much of a political uh, position uh, with regard to the Taliban, though they're clearly not uh, enthusiastic. Turkmenistan quite closed, uh, trying to remain closed to Afghanistan, uh, really as it has been for much of the last 30 years, uh, wrapped around its own ax axle, bound up in its own uh, hermit kingdom type uh, dramas, which are hard to follow from outside. Uh, and the one champion of the Afghan resistance, of the old government, uh, of the cause of opposing the Taliban in the region so far is Tajikistan, where several uh, of the members of the previous government have taken refuge uh, and they are determined to continue fighting. And there are people fighting, though there isn't much hard news about them because they're doing this in places where there are no journalists, uh, in Panjshir, in Herat, in um, Takhar province in the north, all with support uh, leading back to this national resistance movement, which for now is based in exile in Tajikistan. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to turn, uh, we have a few questions coming in from the audience. And, uh, and this one, I think, dovetails nicely with we ended about the regional countries and their interest in, um, in Afghanistan. So I'm going to put this on the screen and read it out. Uh, it's from Rajan Varma. He says, besides the geopolitics, what role has religion, sector sectorality, and feudalism played in the developments of the conflict? Yeah, I mean, I think um, religion is uh, a certain brand of uh, really violently focused religion is the rocket fuel of the Taliban. Uh, you talk to the anti-Taliban leaders of today's Pakistan, Afra Saab Khattak, former senator, uh, Mohsen Dawar, current member of the National Assembly, they speak out against this phenomenon of tele Talibanization uh, on a regular basis, very bravely, uh, but they point over and over again to the fact that the Taliban would not exist were it not for this system of tens of thousands of madrasas in Pakistan that are preaching an extremely narrow, violently focused, uh, obscurantist uh, brand of religion that fires, that, that programs uh, young men to want to join jihad uh, and to fight the, uh, the, the, the great Satan, as they called the United States uh, in Afghanistan. It's not clear uh, where that agenda is going to go now the United States are gone. Uh, but that uh, extremist ideology, and I don't think there's any other term for it, it, is a decisive factor in Afghanistan today because it's brought the Taliban back to power, along with a lot of military assistance and financial assistance and revenue from uh, the opium industry uh, channeled into the Taliban and other groups by Pakistan's uh, military authorities. There is a sectarian issue in Afghanistan. Uh, I mentioned uh, going right back over 100 years to Abdurrahman Khan, um, the divide between Shias who are a minority and Sunnis. There are ethnic divisions, but outsiders tend to overstate uh, those divisions. Uh, the greater division in the last couple of decades has really been between uh, those who've done well, those who've um, had a position in government or been able to make a living, in agriculture or in um, the private sector, and those who have been more or less destitute, uh, as well as between those uh, um, who, who have been living, able to live where they have historically been, 
uh, rooted in a village or a city, and those who've been forced to move uh, by violence or have been victims of violence, either Taliban or US-NATO coalition. Um, those are the bigger divisions, I would argue, uh, although the linguistic, ethnic, religious, uh, feudal divisions, as you mentioned, uh, can't be ignored as well. Uh, people, outsiders, continuously underestimate the strength of Afghan national identity, the sense that Afghans have of belonging to this place, which, after all, goes back a long way. I mean, the term Afghan uh, in one form or another goes right back to uh, ancient, you know, was first mentioned by ancient uh, Greek and Roman chroniclers uh, and Afghanistan, while it has been part of Central Asian empires or the origin of Central Asian empires, part of the Safavid Empire in Persia and previous Persian empires and part of the Mughal Empire, it's always had a very prominent uh, sort of linchpin role in this region. And Afghans know their history. Um, uh, if they don't know the detail of it, they know the grandeur of it. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate how strong that Afghan um, uh, uh, that Afghan identity is, even as outsiders and those interfering in Afghanistan tend to play up uh, the differences, uh, the discrepancies, and the collisions on the lines that you mentioned. Chris, I see there's another question, or at least people um, commenting uh, on, on Twitter on this, and, and I see some people saying, oh, the U.S. created the Taliban. Others saying, no, the U.S. supported Pakistan and Saudi Arabia with the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets. Could you maybe tell us, like, when did the Taliban emerge and, hmm. and how are they slightly different from the Ruhuddin? Because I, I, I see confusion here. I think we need to set right. it straight. Yeah, no, <laughs> the, this is a typical line uh, put forward by ISI propagandists that the U.S. produced the Taliban and um, we're just doing what Washington wanted us to do. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Let's be honest. The U.S. was involved with Pakistan in backing Mujahideen groups from 1979 to 1989. Uh, there were seven or more principal groups that were backed. The largest one that received the lion's share of the military support was Hezb Islami. Gulbuddin Hekmatyar ran one part of that group. Uh, he's still alive and has been in Kabul in recent years. Uh, and the other group under uh, Molavi Khalis, um, also Hezb Islami, had other prominent members, including the Haqqani family, which, who, have, who are still with us today, but in a very um, deadly form with their own group within the Taliban connected to Al-Qaeda called the Haqqani Network. So how do the Mujahideen morph into the Taliban? Basically, Pakistan wanted the Mujahideen to take power uh, after the US abandoned the region in 1989. Uh, that didn't work out, progress was slow. And then when they did take Kabul, there was a civil war, uh, basically between Northerners, uh, the Jamiat and other groups, Jamiat Islami and other groups uh, under Ahmad Shah Massoud and Hezbi Islami then led by Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. This was the most disastrous phase of Afghanistan's recent history. The most casualties, the most deaths, the city of Kabul was literally laid waste. About two thirds of it was physically damaged when the international community started to come back in 2001 by that civil war, not by the Taliban period. And so Pakistan started to despair of ever making any um, deal among the Mujahideen, the old 1980s style Mujahideen groups stick. Uh, and in 1993, a few ISI officers identified a few new uh, players in the Kandahar area, including Mullah Omar, and cobbled together a group called the Taliban. This was really um, a creation of ISI. And that is confirmed by all the serious scholarship out there. Uh, it was just in a conference with Peter Thompson, who was the US uh, charge at the time, negotiator over many of these years. He confirms uh, in his book uh, on Afghanistan that that was the case. Uh, and as the Taliban started to present itself as an alternative to the chaos that the Mujahideen had brought, they gathered strength first in the south and then in Kabul and came to power. And Pakistan has never really dropped them, but they have, uh, I mean, 
Obviously, they have not, but they have tended to support within the Taliban movement the most radical elements. And today, the most radical element are the Haqqani network. That's why they have the key positions in Kabul. Uh, uh, and um, uh, several of the, um, of the, I don't know if you call them more traditional or mainstream, if there is a mainstream in a terrorist group, leaders of the Taliban, such as uh, Abdul Ghani Baradar, have been sidelined as uh, the Haqqanis have been given these critical posts. Uh, and it's, it's really not uh, a mystery to anyone how this is happening. When there were disputes among these groups, the Director General of ISI, Lieutenant General Faiz Hamid, flew to Kabul to resolve this dispute and was captured uh, on camera uh, in Kabul's Serena Hotel as he began this cycle of meetings. So there isn't really an effort even to disguise uh, the ISI sponsorship of the Taliban uh, and their practice of rewarding the most extreme groups in the proxy armies that they sponsor continues to this day. Chris, fascinating. And I, 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 thanks for uh, that, that cleared up. Uh, I'm not an Afghan expert, but I, I think that really helped me understand things historically as well as contemporary. Um, talking about these, there's some questions coming in that, that I think that feed really well off that last point you made. It's about the Kani networks, more extremist, um, but also uh, other groups uh, like ISIS that are starting to, to um, form in Afghanistan and the possibility that other um, people affiliated with this Salafi jihadist ideology or Diobandi ideology, whichever you reframe it, might travel to Afghanistan. What do you see um, from a security perspective? Are these groups going to get out of control? Will it spill over into Afghanistan, uh, into Pakistan? I know, I know a lot of Pakistani uh, experts are saying, you know, we're playing with fire. This could destabilize our country. And, and we saw the um, a couple of different cricket teams, the UK and, and New Zealand, not wanting to travel to Pakistan in the last few weeks for fear of being attacked. Is this genie, is it going to blow out of the bottle and, and lead to, to more terrorism? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, the best indicator we have of what this new era might hold is the period when the Taliban were last in control of Afghanistan, 1996 to 2001, when uh, we saw a steady stream of escalating attacks uh, organized by Al-Qaeda in either Afghanistan or Pakistan, uh, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, USS Cole, uh, the Bali bombings, culminating in the 9-11 attacks. And no one is predicting that you know, exactly that scenario will be repeated. But uh, And the world is much more vigilant and much more prepared uh, to try to counter these threats. Uh, but nor should we take it lightly. These are groups that have not just an agenda of subjugating Afghanistan, erasing Afghan national identity, um, uh, making uh, Afghanistan subservient to their uh, really obscurantist uh, ideology. They also have an ideology of global jihad. That's why the Taliban are still deeply uh, enmeshed with Al-Qaeda uh, and other groups whose agenda is international. And obviously, their success in Afghanistan this summer uh, immediately appeals to um, fighters and potential fighters across the Middle East and North Africa who's, who've seen Daesh, the appeal of ISIS as it has lost territory, fizzle out, in certainly in Syria, in Iraq, and elsewhere, uh, and may see it as an attractive proposition to go to Afghanistan or to connect with what is happening in Afghanistan uh, and to launch their own plans on the basis of that inspiration. Um, so yes, I mean, we saw US uh, top US generals this yesterday and in previous weeks testifying that they expect Al-Qaeda to be sufficiently re reconstituted in Afghanistan to be able to launch uh, international attacks within a year. Uh, and given that such forecasts are usually wrong, we have to <laughs> expect that it could be even faster than that. What about the Islamic State in Khorasan and the Tariqi Taliban, Pakistan, and other groups that are often seen as threats to Pakistan itself? We have to understand that they all have the same root. Um, the Islamic State in 
South Asia, Pakistan and Afghanistan primarily, was created in the months and years after 2014 from proven jihadist leaders that had been involved in other groups sponsored by ISI. And ISI plays a very clever game, again, um, championing an extremist approach so that their more moderate proxies can be seen as uh, the solution to, uh, you know, the lesser of two evils um, and, and win legitimacy as a result. Uh, this is an argument Pakistanis uh, at all levels have been making ever since the takeover that the outside world should really uh, work with the Taliban, give the Taliban legitimacy because there are more extreme elements inside Afghanistan that need to be addressed. Um, and the suicide bombing outside of Kabul airport this summer was meant to reinforce that message. Uh, if we fall into that trap, we're not going to get anywhere. We need to deal root and branch with the issue of sponsorship of terrorist groups. The Islamic State in Khorasan has done hor horrific things and they've fought with other groups. There's no question about this. But anyone who thinks that the Haqqani network, which is now controlling the regime in Kabul, is more moderate, uh, simply hasn't read the facts. They invented suicide bombing in Afghanistan. They have systematically uh, brainwashed and deployed hundreds, probably thousands by now, uh, child soldiers to become suicide attackers. They are responsible for many of the bloodiest attacks against civilians in Afghan history. Uh, and their um, role in the reprisals now underway against former government officials, uh, journalists, uh, civil society leaders is extremely well documented. So there's really no moderate group to choose here. We need to treat this ecosystem as a whole and deal with its roots, which are in uh, a policy across the border in the corridors of power of the sixth largest military in the world. It's that policy that needs to be held to account. Thank you, Chris, and and I, I thanks for mentioning. Um, you know, I, I've had chuckles at seeing people in the media or suggest that uh, the Taliban will be new counterterrorism partners. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, that, how it's just the most um, asinine thing one can say. But there are people trying to propose this, and and maybe some gullible leaders following it. So, Chris, I have two two last questions. Um, you've been generous with your time. Um, I'm going to pull up this one because I, I think you touched a, a bit upon it. But I think we could expand a bit more. It says, would you mind sharing your insights on what exactly Pakistan wants from Afghanistan? And what is Pakistan's end goal? I, I know you talked about you know, having kind of strategic depth, but what's its end goal in all of this? Well, first, let me say that most Pakistanis, uh, and it's a country of over 200 million people, simply want peaceful relations with Afghanistan. They want Afghanistan to uh, be able to pursue its own national life, uh, trade freely with Pakistan and uh, put the conflicts of the back uh, of the past behind, uh, behind themselves in Afghanistan and behind the whole region. But policy with regard to Afghanistan inside the Pakistani state is made not by civilians, not by parliament, not by um, democratic institutions in any form. It is made by a very small group of military planners under Pakistan's top generals. And this group uh, is committed to something called strategic depth, which means we're not going to beat India in a conventional war, so we better um, have enough unconventional war warfare capacity, enough irregular forces, proxies uh, motivated, motivated by this ideology that we are uh, generating in our madrasa network to be able to defeat them in Kashmir inside India itself uh, and in other places across uh, South Asia. Um, and our key platform for developing that capacity should be Afghanistan. That has been their dream. That's why they call it strategic depth. Uh, Afghanistan gives them territory reaching up towards Central Asia that then allows them to influence uh, through extremists, Western China, Tajikistan, 
Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, in a way that they believe uh, encircles India and then creates a new threat in Kashmir. It's amazing to uh, imagine that this group has such influence inside Pakistan, a country with such uh, a rich uh, human capital, so many educated people, so many intelligent people, so many moderate people. Uh, but they really do think this way. Uh, and they really are convinced that strategic depth and an agenda of global jihad as championed by Al-Qaeda go hand in hand. And they are the winners in Afghanistan as of this summer. Uh, so what is their agenda? It is to maintain that dominance in Afghanistan, use it as a platform for influencing other countries, blackmailing other countries if necessary, uh, and prevent India from having any influence in Afghanistan at all uh, by uh, removing from power any and all of those who are opposed to this brand of ideology and extremism. Um, for now, uh, this group is in charge. The idea of sanctioning those in Pakistan responsible for sponsoring these groups is important because it, if it's done properly and by many countries, will actually change the balance of power inside Pakistan. It will reduce uh, the, or break the stranglehold on Afghan policy, Afghanistan policy that this small group of generals and officers have had and open up the discussion to a larger group uh, of of. Pakistanis who clearly uh, do not like this agenda of Talibanization, violence, and global jihad. So, Chris, one last. I just want to get your feedback, and then and then we'll, we'll we'll let you go on for your day. But I'm sure you've seen Imran Khan. Uh, he addressed the General Assembly, um, and he he made some claims stating that the, the Taliban has agreed to respect human rights. To this is four days ago, by the way, to respect human rights, to be form an inclusive government. Um, and then yet we're seeing people being hung by cranes. We're seeing, uh, uh, you know, we're seeing female journalists, female judges trying to get out of the country. Um, and then he, he basically argued that, you know, we must embrace the Taliban. That's the only way that if we show them the path, they will go in the path is what are your thoughts on this? Is this the biggest disinformation campaign on the planet in 2021? What are your thoughts? Well, disinformation only works if people buy it if uh, people are influenced by it. And I think what Imran Khan has been selling for months now is, is, I mean, it would be considered ridiculous, preposterous if it weren't so tragic and dangerous. Uh, I mean, we have to see him really as someone who has absolutely no influence over what has happened in Afghanistan, who is uh, in office as the selected prime minister, as they call him in Pakistan, only by the good graces of uh, general headquarters uh, and, and the military officers serving and retired who recruited him, uh, for whom he was a good candidate because he's a famous former cricket star who happens to be willing to champion the Taliban, uh, who happens to be willing to defend the indefensible. And, and I could say that from personal experience, we've seen him this week uh, at the United Nations. But years ago, before he became prime minister, he was traveling the world. I saw him once uh, in, in a friend's home in um, Toronto, defending, giving a full-throated defense to the Taliban who were there, who were at that time, this was years ago, very far from power, about the most enthusiastic full-throated defense of the Taliban that I've seen anyone uh, ever give, including most Taliban commanders and members that I've spoken to privately who find their own organization uh, reprehensible in many ways. So he's he's a useful um, idiot for Pakistan's generals. He is the front man for this, uh, I think, doomed PR campaign because it is impossible to uh, appeal to the international community to give this group time uh, to argue that they will be representative or respect human rights when, as you say, uh, people are being um, killed, executed in, in the public square in cold blood and hung from cranes. And when uh, women are being disenfranchised in the most egregious ways uh, we've seen anywhere on the planet. Uh, and when pogroms are happening against uh, ethnic groups uh, or 
uh, veterans of the previous regime on a scale that hasn't been seen in ages either. Uh, so, uh, you know, what the way we should take Imran Khan and his foreign minister um, Qureshi is as representatives, apologists for the Taliban regime. That's the way they see themselves. That's the task they've been given by the generals. And it simply proves uh, Pakistan's uh, complicity in bringing these terrorists to power. Uh, and it also reminds us that the only appropriate response to this disaster is to hold those uh, who made it happen to account. And they are uh, the generals who who, who who are really the puppet masters for Imran Khan, uh, his foreign minister and others. Chris, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day. On behalf of the Canadian National Council, the Montreal branch, we thank you. Uh, we're going to post this video online soon so people can share it. Um, and there were some questions people wanted to ask, but not enough time. Apologies, everyone. But just once again, Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing your knowledge. Thanks very much, Kyle. It was a pleasure to be with you. And thanks to everyone for their interest. We have to keep up uh, the discussion of these issues.